commissioner work session on the sustainable business park. It's been an exciting project. It's nothing new. We just didn't start it and pull it out of the air. It's been something in the works for the last number of years. Um, this kind of started off, Commissioner Skaggs and I, this summer went um, with members from DPW and um, our um, consultants from GBB in the right place. We had the opportunity to actually tour some of these facilities out in Des Moines, Iowa, and um, California as well. So we went to the finalists um, facilities to see what they were all about. And it was really great to check out Herbicer and Continuous, which also included Energia. And um, this was a key step in the evaluation process. And um, we're working on diverting um, about 90% of our trash. And this was something that was started about five years ago back in 2016, and it was adopted by the Board of Public Works. So one of the things we were able to see was how um, they were able to embrace um, technological alternatives to repurpose waste and um, put them into new products instead of landfilling. And that's one of our goals. We only have so much space on this earth to put stuff in the landfill, and if we can find a way to reuse stuff, that is our goal. So we witnessed these examples by both Continuous and um, Herbicer, and in many ways, um, the journey we've started here with the Sustainable Business Park could be compared to what we have going on just down the road at the Medical Mile. And as with every new opportunity, there's risks, but also rewards. I definitely see the potential for the creation of um, a new economic cluster around recycling and waste management. And there's opportunities for um, scientists and engineers as well to come into the community and find ways to divert this uh, waste. And I also see the opportunity for um, other businesses to be part of it, to add on to what we have going on at the Sustainable Business Park. So here we have um, the opportunity to draw um, several um, hundred thousand dollars from private investment and also the opportunity to create new jobs while being stewards of our earth. And we have um, a good presentation for you today to give you some more information on the Sustainable Business Park and the anchor tenant recommendation. I encourage you to ask away, ask all the questions. You got some good knowledge right in front of you. So I welcome you guys. Dar, you want to kick us off? Thank you, Commissioner Brevi and uh, Chair Bolter. Thank you for giving us time today in this work session. Um, Dar Boss, I'm the Director of Public Works for Kent County. We're so excited to be here this morning. Uh, we were able to provide a recommendation to the Board of Public Works last week, and we wanted to spend a few minutes with you this morning uh, to share what we were able to share with them and, of course, answer questions. Uh, we have a team here to present. It's been a team effort from day one, and I wanted to make sure that we had uh, the best in front of you to both present and to be able to answer your questions. So solid waste management is one of those things that uh, we don't tend to think about a lot. Uh, we put our trash in the, in the cart, it goes to the curb, it goes away, and as long as it's going away, uh, we, just, we just don't give it much more thought than that. Uh, the reality is, is Kent County generates one million tons of municipal solid waste each year. Uh, and it continues to grow. As our community grows, as the economy uh, uh, continues to improve and expand, and as more people uh, want to enjoy living and working here and playing here, we're just seeing that generation uh, increase. As uh, Commissioner Brevi mentioned, back in 2018, the Board of Public Works uh, approved what was called the Solid or the, the uh, Sustainable Business Park Master Plan. And that master plan was really a roadmap that laid out uh, a thought process around how do we move forward in exploring and, and better understanding what the alternatives to landfilling. And with that, they gave us a three-year window where we put a mor moratorium on developing more landfill space so that we could focus on uh, diversion. So our presentation this morning is really a culmination of those three years of work. It has been a learning process. We went into this process understanding a lot of the technologies and potential, but we didn't understand exactly how it all could come together. So this learning process uh, has been significant, and we're so excited to be able to share that with you this morning. So presenting with me this morning will be Steve Faber from uh, Byron Pliss. We have, uh, I forgot his name, Steve. <laughs> Steve Simmons. I had the Steve, I didn't have the Simmons. Yeah, I've only known you forever. Steve Simmons from GBB, they're our consultant, and they've been alongside us for years. 
uh, exploring these new alternatives. And finally, Tim Ross from the right place. So we take a lot of our philosophical orientation around how we approach solid waste management from Vern Ehlers. Congressman Ehlers back in the 70s was a commissioner here on this board and was also on our Board of Public Works. And there's a couple quotes from him there, but I wanted to focus on the first one. His visioning back in the 70s and early 80s was that he believed there was a time that in Kent County, only 20% of what we generated as trash would have to go to landfill and that the, the balance of that could be used in different ways. And one of those things that you see that was part of, of his legacy is our waste to energy facility. So today we operate four facilities to manage uh, trash, if you will, in Kent County. We have our recycling and education center where we process a little over 30,000 tons of uh, residential recycling that comes in from not only Kent County, uh, but seven other counties around us. So it's a very regional facility. We're managing material from eight different counties. We have our South Kent landfill and that facility opened in the mid 1980s and it has about 10 years of airspace left. We have our waste energy facility that was commissioned in 1990 and has been operating. Uh, we're into our 31st year of operation. And then we also opened uh, the North Kent transfer station to make sure that those in the northern part of the county had access to recycling and disposal um, options uh, as they as businesses operate in that area, uh, trash haulers and of course residents themselves can use the facility. We do have tours scheduled uh, next Monday to September 13. I think goes from 9 to noon. Uh, we invite you to participate if you're not familiar with these facilities and we'd love to share a little bit more and give you some more context about what we do day to day. Probably the best way to think about how we <coughs> manage solid waste in, in Kent County, it's a integrated system. We use a, a variety of facilities as I've described to uh, do our business day to day and manage waste here in Kent County. Presently, uh, this three-legged stool concept takes a look at it uh, with kind of three pillars. One is we manage source separated recyclables at the Recycling Education Center. We have our South Kent landfill and we have the North Kent transfer station. And then finally, we use waste to energy as that uh, fourth, uh, and fourth uh, facility and third pillar to manage waste. In the future, as we envision, we see where uh, we'll be sliding out the South Kent landfill and putting in the sustainable business park as we continue to operate the North Kent transfer station. So in the future, uh, we, we see an opportunity to uh, use landfill as kind of the last option, uh, the least best option. There'll always be a need for landfill, uh, but we believe that, uh, and our goal of course is to divert 90% away from landfill by the year. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the process uh, and the community engagement that got us to this recommendation. So uh, as Dar mentioned, this has been an ongoing process that really ramped up or started in 2016, uh, where there was a waste characterization study done that really showed the value of the waste that was being uh, thrown away in the landfill each year. And we realized through that, there was a lot that can be recaptured. And so that's what really spearheaded or started the goal of the 90% by 2030 <clears throat> and included a roadmap to reimagine how we are disposing of waste. Uh, the Sustainable Business Park Master Planning process started in 2017. Uh, in 2018, uh, that plan was approved and as Dar said, it really gave us the three year runway to test out, to prove uh, proof of concept really that this was a, a, a process that would work for us here in Kent County and that fit and belonged in Kent County. Uh, through 2019, there were additional studies being done, uh, really looking at the infrastructure needs of that site, the 250 acres adjacent to the landfill that really is agricultural land now, what would be required to really create an industrial park there, uh, as well as the sequencing of how could we attract these investments, and, and Tim from the right place will talk about that a little bit later. In 2020 and through 2021 was really where we began the anchor tenant RFP uh, procurement process. <clears throat> we call that the anchor tenant because through this, uh, through this process, we realized we really needed uh, that anchor that could process enough waste instead of parceling it out into smaller businesses uh, 
but really the long-term goal are these secondary and tertiary businesses that will come and complement this anchor tenant. Uh, and then really the last year has been going through that evaluation process. Uh, there have been a lot of people uh, that have interfaced with this process over the last, uh, last year and before that. Uh, and here you can see a number of those uh, groups represented. But through this process, we've had elected and staff uh, officials from the six cities, from Kent and Allegan County, because again, we're, we're straddling that line. Uh, the different townships, both in Kent and Allegan. We've had private sector around the table, uh, the private organic composting uh, companies, as well as those that are in that private recycling space, local manufacturers, furniture manufacturers, plastic companies, uh, and waste haulers, and then also the nonprofit community uh, economic development groups like the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, environmental groups, and those in education and higher education as well, really bringing in the research components that will be part of this. Uh, so there are a number of folks. Uh, we continue to engage them throughout this process, uh, but you can kind of get a flavor for uh, how much engagement has gone on throughout this. Real quickly, uh, in terms of the procurement process, uh, so last year uh, began this process. There were nine overall respondents to the RFP that was put out through uh, Kent County. Five of those were shortlisted, and then that was brought down to the two finalists. Uh, you can see there uh, along the side the, the different or the matrix we really use to evaluate and to run uh, to really screen uh, and get to the point where we could uh, compare apples to apples between these two uh, different companies. The RFP evaluation team included the right place, uh, Fishbeck, the county, uh, Byram and Fisk, Plant Moran, GBB, and Sustainable Research Group. So there were a number of finalist interviews that were uh, done with these folks, as well as the site tours that Commissioner Breve uh, talked about uh, visiting in Iowa and California to really see what does this look like on the ground? How do these facilities fit in the context of their community? Are they, uh, are, do they belong there? Do they, does it feel like these are uh, real legitimate companies that we, can, uh, that we can model? We did a full financial analysis. That was really why Plant Moran was uh, brought on board and that included uh, risk analysis. What is the risk to the county? What is the risk to, uh, to this company to uh, come here? And we'll talk a little bit about that um, as, as there are with any new endeavor like this risk involved, uh, but we want to we want to mitigate that. We want to uh, manage that. We also had them complete a staffing and investment analysis for the MEDC, uh, and that really led then to this final selection. Uh, finally, we knew uh, going into this that uh, there would be a fee increase related to doing something different. Uh, we all know it's very cheap to throw things in a hole in the ground and cover it with dirt. Uh, that is the cheapest option. Uh, it's not the best option, we believe, but it's the cheapest option. Anything that we do different from that is going to cost more money. And so what we wanted to do was start to feel out what is the community's uh, response to that? What are their attitudes and perceptions? So we did do a uh, 600 resident survey uh, with Epic MRA, a polling and research firm. Uh, and what we found was two thirds of respondents uh, supported this idea of mixed waste processing. And that increased to almost 80% when they learned more about what this would bring to the community in terms of economic development and whatnot, uh, having additional landfills. Uh, we tested out a specific number that we thought would be in the range that this mixed waste processor would uh, bring to the table as well. Uh, and what we learned through that is people are willing to pay more for curbside collection if it means that there is a true alternative to landfilling. And that the community wants these alternatives and we sampled from northern, central and southern Kent County uh, and across the board uh, the community wants more recycling and more access to recycling. They want more in terms of the waste energy facility and they want this new facility around mixed waste processing. Uh, the most compelling reasons why they said they support these alternatives are first and foremost economic development, the private investment, the jobs, uh, and uh, doing something that would uh, create additional economic development. And followed by uh, not leaving a landfill legacy for their kids uh, and for the next generation, as well as protecting West Michigan's natural environment. 
Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Morning, Commissioners. Uh, I was asked to keep my comments brief this morning, so under protest, I will keep, the, keep them to two minutes. Um, I, I'm glad Steve Faber mentioned uh, the, the, the survey results uh, that he just went over because that, e that, in essence, is the economic development strategy around this, around this project. Um, what I want to talk about this morning is make some brief comments about the economic development perspective of this project um, and the anchor tenant. I've been honored to be part of this project since the beginning of it, so it's, it's exciting to see this come to fruition um, and, and see the next steps of this. But um, at the right place, we, we follow an economic development model focused on three pillars. Uh, people, place, and prosperity. It's very simple. Uh, the first one, and to address this project, regarding people, simply put, this, this project creates the much needed jobs uh, that West Michigan needs just south, uh, uh, just south of town in a rural community that, that, that desperately needs those. From a place perspective, it builds a cleaner, more sustainable community for West Michigan's future. Like Steve said, it's not digging another hole and, and burying, burying trash and leaving that for future. Uh, and arguably, uh, most importantly, prosperity. The important thing to remember is not only does this project alone with this anchor tenant bring millions of dollars in, in, in capital investment to West Michigan on this one project, but it also will lead to future businesses that want to co-locate with this anchor tenant and this national brand that comes here uh, to build out the larger sustainable business part. Um, I will say at the right place, we've already started to receive phone calls even through this RFP process from businesses around the country, knowing that they're not going to be that anchor tenant, but saying, keep me posted on what's going on. I want to throw my name in the hat. So we, we literally have um, a, a pool of businesses, of business leads now that we have, that we have said uh, most directly, not yet, but they're ready. So, um, so as we discuss this project this morning, please know that you know that the right place we are fully supportive, not just of the sustainable the sustainable business part, but also of this anchor tenant. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'll turn it over to Steve Simmons and to go over more of the details of the actual system proposals. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Steve Simmons. I'm the president of the firm Gershman, Brickner, and Bratton, or GBB as we go by. And we've been the county's advisors on this project uh, since the beginning. Uh, G a little bit about GBB, we are a solid waste advisory firm, been in business for 40 years. 70% of our clients are local, city, county, waste authority. Uh, we help them plan and implement new solid waste management programs, policies, and importantly, infrastructure, which we're here to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to use a, you've heard this term, mixed waste processing. I'm going to explain just a little bit maybe to you what that is, so there's not a, a lot of confusion. It's not a lot of black box magic. It's, it's some very proven technology. But basically, it is a set of equipment and technologies which can accept the 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 container that you wheel to the cart this morning, to the curbside this morning. You know, all your trash from the weekend and the paper plates from your Labor Day party and all, and it's all in one bag at the, at the curb. It can accept that material and segregate it into various streams of like materials. So piles of plastic, piles of high grade fiber, metals, and, and it separates it out It'll also separate out food waste and get it over into another pile so it can be processed and turned into uh, methane gas. So that's what it is. Uh, I've got a picture of it here. If, it, if you've been to your current existing material recovery facility, it looks a lot like this. And in fact, these facilities are functionally the same thing. In a mixed waste processing plant, you take basically the same equipment you build it a little bigger because it processes just more through and maybe a little more robust because it's got to handle the whole of the waste stream. It's not a clean stream of bottles and cans. It's got everything in it. So you just build it bigger and beefier, but it's the same fundamental technology. 
So the industry accepts mis mixed waste processing as a very mature technology. There's six or seven original equipment vendors who build this material, these, this equipment, just like they build for a material recovery facility. And the selected vendors have used a list of five or six that we gave them and said, pick your mixed waste processing equipment from these vendors. Uh, a disclaimer, you know, I am an engineer, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the bells and whistles and gizmos here. I'm going to try to address as I go through here what I think are the policy considerations that you as, as policy leaders should be thinking about. But I don't want to impose that upon you, and I'll certainly answer any questions uh, that you may have going forward. As mentioned uh, earlier, last week we made a recommendation to the Board of Public Works and we recommended from the two finalists a joint venture proposal from the two firms Continuous Materials and Energia. Uh, this, is a risk, this is a slide from that presentation and just some of the reasons they were selected versus the competition. It had to do with experienced EPC, I see I, I got an engineering lingo in there, that, I'm sorry, that's, that's engineering procurement and construction. It's, it's the building, they have experience building uh, a large complex facility. Both of these companies have built facilities before. Uh, a medium amount of DP bonding requirements, we'll address that in more detail later. Uh, a moderate risk to the DPW on revenue sharing. Uh, in this, the DPW will pay a processing fee and they'll get back from the vendor some revenue sharing or royalties. And we assessed what's the risk uh, of that royalty stream or payment stream back to the DPW, both in markets, price volatility, uh, those kind of issues. And then the fact that they could get to the immediately to the 60% diversion goal, the other uh, offer was at a 50% diversion goal. So those were some of the reasons that factored into why select continuous and energia. Uh, in this slide, we've tried to summarize um, just some key attributes of the facility. In the technology, it's shredding, it's what we call near infrared. Think of this as, there's, there's, in this plant, there's a bunch of very automated equipment, including robots with machine learning, uh, the, the state of the art, but yet still we're, we would be able to stand here in front of you, say, proven technologies. Uh, anaerobic digestion, which is a technology that can take the food scraps and convert it into methane, which can be then put into the pipeline system and used as renewable natural gas. And then importantly, with this proposal, board production, and you're going to hear a little bit more about this, but not only in this proposal was there the mixed waste processing plant, but fully integrated at the back end is a manufacturing facility, a manufacturing facility that will make a board, a four by eight sheet of board, suitable for construction purposes. And it's, it's got an application in flat roof marketing. So this is really, this is really a, a, a first of a kind in the country where if you're old enough like me and you remember the movie Back to the Future and they put the Mr. Fusion can in and a product comes out. Here, trash trucks will drive up and out the back end will go a finished construction project, product ready to go to the market. Uh, capacity, this plant's the size for 400,000 tons a year. It's also got a capability of doing 30,000 tons per year of your single stream recyclables. Um, inputs or municipal solid waste, it can take your single stream recyclables. It could also take source separated organics. The outputs were the board, the gas, the fertilizer, there's fertilizer from the AD system and recyclables. There is some residue. Uh, still some are going to have to go to a landfill, but that's also opportunity for these secondary and tertiary uh, companies that could come in after, take those streams and process them. We did tour a facility in Des Moines, Iowa. That's the board production plant. That plant's been in operation for six to eight years. It is still, though, small enough, we wouldn't describe it as a full-scale commercial plant. It makes product. They're sending product to market. People are buying it, and when you talk to the people that are buying it, their only complaint is, I can't get enough of it. The plant's too small. Uh, that's the continuous plant. The Energia plant, they've built several. They're a big publicly listed company now. We visited their facility in California. We spoke with uh, plants as far away as Cyprus that they had, they had built, and we got a thumbs up on all of them. Uh, 
sixty five employees or so twenty acres and about a half a million square feet under roof manufacturing complex these again are the outputs the roof board you can see the the roof board there over on the left that's how it would go to the job site to be lifted up on top of the Walmart to replace their roof uh, fertilizer renewable natural gas and some commodities this this brings it down to you know what what are the dollars about this so the overall project that we're talking about is about a 340 to 350 million dollar investment at the sustainable business park the proposal is that the county would fund about 70 million out of that and for the 70 million they would own the buildings and some of the key equipment at the very front end that's necessary to ensure operations and to ensure uh, delivery of secure delivery of the waste the bulk of the investment would come from the private sector they would raise 280 million dollars from investors loans bank loans bonding and invest it there at the business park we do show here for both there's an one t there's an investment that the DPW needs to make to bring that raw land up to a business park standard this would be for streets and utility infrastructures and the things that a community does to prep a site we did uh, some modeling with plant Moran and to look at what would be the impact to fees that the DPW would need to charge and we came back after doing modeling and this would be for all DPW cost it's the cost of overhead it's the cost of the legacy landfills it's all DPW expenses they would need to charge seventy six dollars a ton to the clients to to people using the system so it's a user fee that was modeled as all materials they manage at all locations we didn't try to break it up waste of energy versus transfer station versus this we just we tried to get our arms around it all it's complex enough I think uh, any further level of refinement isn't warranted at this point seventy six dollars a ton what did that mean to the average single-family homeowner 2.6 uh, people per house uh, it comes down incrementally above and beyond what they're paying today about three dollars and ten cents a month that's the increase that the average homeowner would see with this system reconfigured this way so Star? thank you Steve to give you some sense of the business park itself what we're intending to build is a class a uh, uh, business park and to have an idea of how continuous materials or CM plus A as we refer to it today fits in there you can see from this slide that we have uh, Fishback is our engineering uh, partner uh, engineering uh, engineer of record and you can see where the facility actually fits within the phase one of the uh, business park the exciting thing about that is it, it provides then uh, three to four significant parcels where other secondary tenants would also be able to locate um, so as we look at the phase one development and Steven mentioned that 19 million dollars DPW is working uh, to secure inf various infrastructure dollars uh, we have some uh, landfill construction funds that are available along with uh, various grant sources including the MEDC uh, the CBDG I think I said that in the right order and others that have expressed interest in uh, helping to fund the infrastructure development infrastructure means roads it means uh, water sewer gas and electrical that would bring this uh, up to a class a level facility so I wanted to focus a minute on the continuous material and actually the everboard as they call it you should have uh, a, a piece here sitting at your uh, at your desk and and the exciting part of this material is this is 100% uh, recycled low-value paper fiber and plastic film and this is actually constructed in a 4 by 8 sheet so if you saw a sheet of plywood or uh, OSB or something similar to that at the hardware store or at the uh, building store this would be uh, a material that you could also see there it's used for low or uh, no slope roofing it's a roof cover board it is a material that is um, better than 
the alternatives. It's superior in that regard. But the story really behind it is that for every 100,000 square or 1,000 square feet of this board that's produced, uh, we divert 2,000 pounds of trash away from the landfill. Again, low value paper fiber and plastic film, which are two significant items that we struggle with. Uh, you may recall about a year or so ago, we had to ban the, the placement of plastic uh, shopping bags in the recycling carts because um, they're tanglers, they create issues in our facility, and we end up not being able to market those because they're too dirty and wet for us to, to move them on as a commodity. That type of plastic, that plastic film, would be able to be incorporated into this Everboard. The proposed manufacturing plant uh, that's been proposed by CM plus A is they would produce 150 million square feet of this Everboard annually at the facility that's been proposed at the Sustainable Business Park. A real example of that, uh, you can go to Nebraska and there's a Target store that actually has that roof cover board installed as a system with that low slope uh, roof system. Uh, the, the story here is 55,000 pounds of consumer plastic and 103,000 pounds of paper were diverted from the landfill, used as a feedstock, and actually placed into this Everboard that was then installed on this target. So some next steps. We did present a recommendation to our Board of Public Works last week. Uh, we're here before you this morning in a work session to share more about that recommendation. Uh, we'll be circling back with many of the stakeholder groups that we've been working with over the last number of months and years to share with them more detail about our recommendation, uh, the cost structure, uh, the private-public investment, and what that me could mean for West Michigan. Uh, there's an October 7 board meeting where we'll be uh, discussing with our Board of Public Works, uh, are we prepared and are we ready to move into a next phase around uh, a project development agreement? and we'll talk through more about what that means with them. But there's a number of intersections here with the, uh, the Board of Commissioners that's so critical, and one is uh, the issue of a feedstock agreement. In order for a facility like this to operate, and for, as Steve mentioned, the 280 plus million dollars that they would uh, provide in private investment, we have to ensure that that material can go to that facility and actually be processed. Literally, the way this plant is designed, and Tim Raz also mentioned it, is a trash truck today that's going to the landfill, going up on the working face and dumping, would drive to this facility and dump on a tipping floor. That material would be processed and all the various feedstocks would then be placed in, their, in the bunkers and that material would then move to uh, the continuous plant board where they would generate this, this Everboard material. But they have to know if they're gonna make the $280 million investment, will the material be there for us? Because if it's not, and they don't have the feedstock, they obviously can't generate the board and, and, and pay uh, their bondholders and, and uh, make a profit, if you will. So that's one intersection with the Board of Commissioners. The other one is around, of course, funding, and, and we're going to continue to work through that. Uh, but the reality is um, for us to bring in a facility like this and to attract the uh, private investment, we will have to leverage that with public investment. And uh, on one of the previous slides, uh, Steve had mentioned the $70 million. Uh, that would be uh, above and beyond what the DPW would be able to manage within its budget. And that's something that we would have to come back to the Board of Commissioners for, for consideration. So those are some of the next steps. Uh, we're happy and, and available to answer as many questions as you have. And we just again thank you for your time this morning so that we could present. Thank you, Dyer. I think there's probably several questions that have bubbled up during this conversation, so I look forward to hearing from them. Um, are there any commissioners that have questions? Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my first question is, um, you mentioned 65 full-time employees. Has there been any discussion on the skill and wage range of the full-time employees themselves? Uh, no, no direct dis uh, well. That's worse. Yeah, just, just turn it on. Just use that mic. <laughs> we can we can hear you. Uh, let me just Yikes. use that mic. We didn't have um, a lot of direct discussions with the vendors, but in general, given that this is a highly automated plant, the 
the technicians will be more maintenance technicians and electricians and, and at that level there will be some labor jobs there's there's still a manual picking at the very front end uh, you know four or five employees that just machines still can't do it all right so they are early on it there's a big I don't know a sofa lands on the conveyor and, and I've been doing trash for 35 years so it's not inconceivable to me that a sofa lands on the conveyor uh, you know that needs to get picked off by hand but in general, these are, are higher up the wage scale than, than lower. Thank you. And so the, the follow-up to that is, um, you know, I, I, was, I, I appreciated the connection with the medical mile. I thought that made a great deal of sense. One of the, the key differences I could at least see is the fact that the medical mile, there's multiple ways to get there by car or by transit, and this is just outside of the, the transit service area. Has there been discussion of replicating some kind of last mile service similar to what I think the Meyer corporate headquarters has just to improve the, the connectivity and, and yield a larger labor market? So I think, I think, I thought you were going a different direction in terms of the question. So let me answer what I think you asked. And if I didn't, please follow up. Uh, in terms of managing the material around Kent County, we're looking very much at where that material is located and how to best get it there. Um, but I think I, I may not be answering your question because I think right at the end you were speaking more to, talking about to labor, labor. And, yeah. and trying to connect it to our transportation network, our transit system, so that more across the, the, the labor market could, could potentially well, I'm going to better punt to Tim because I know that he has spoken to this issue. The answer to your question is no, but a more detailed explanation is um, we have already started discussions not not just with DPW and uh, CN Plus A, um, but with most um, companies around West Michigan are, are having this problem. Whether they're down and you know down at the South 131 or whether they're right in the heart of this city, um, the, the unique challenge we're going to have on this project is the specific location where this is at is in Allegan County. And we have a Kent County, Grand Rapids, six city based transit system. So you're asking a larger policy question <laughs> on this one, uh, but, but there are opportunities. Um, we do have opportunities to, to connect with like wheels to work and some other folks like that. So um, th th those discussions uh, can, can certainly be had. And then my last question, uh, and I'll yield everything back, um, is because of the leasing structure, um, is the property going to remain tax exempt or will it now become a taxable property by leasing it to a, a business? Yeah, so it's the, I th we think it's the best of both worlds in that we want to ensure that, that the facility and that the business park is successful. And we think the best way to model and manage that facility and the, the, the companies that, that site there is for Kent County to retain ownership because we can set the environmental standards and everything else around the design, and that's why Fishbeck has been working alongside us these last three years. The property itself is not taxable and would not be in the future. The development, the improvements would be taxable. We did uh, go to, uh, uh, to, proper, to equalization to talk that through. We've met with Door Township, Allegan County, as well as Kent County to get opinion on that, which is a benefit to Door Township instead of future landfill development. They actually have a business park where we retain ownership. We ensure that the, the facilities and the properties and the, um, the businesses that locate there are there for the intended purpose, but the improvements would be taxable. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Jones. Thank you. Um, let's see. Where do I want to begin? I think I'm going to begin with the um, this end product is a really cool visual. What about <coughs> all those other pieces that are getting split off of the trash is one going to compost one you know you hit so all of these pieces are where the other all of those other pieces are going to go to one of these it's a great question so one of the things that our team evaluated is the, the, the diversification of the end products so on the far right side you still have certain recycling commodities that you would generate you're going to have plastic containers and aluminum cans and steel cans, a lot like what you put in your recycling bin today, those would continue to be generated, but we would capture more 
because we only have about 25% participation in Kent County in recycling programs. So all of that waste would actually be processed and all of those commodities would be separated out. So that's one end product. And those would be sold uh, in the Midwest as they are now, uh, similar to what we have with our recycling and education center. Um, then to the next right is the renewable natural gas. You would take the food waste uh, that's in the trash and you separate that out and you place that in an anaerobic digestion system that then does two things. First, it creates renewable natural gas that can be placed into the pipeline. And we've had conversations with DTE. Uh, they've given us estimates of putting in the pipeline to be able to first clean up that gas and then be able to put it in as RNG. But after that food waste has been digested, it then is available and ready to be fertilizer. That's been processed. All the, the um, energy has been extracted, but there's still nutrient value. So that could go <coughs> to a commercial uh, fertilizing operation. There's one nearby in Allegan County. They actually take in rail cars of various materials and they blend it and make fertilizer out of it. This is an organic fraction that could go into fertilizer. So do you get the profits when all of this gets sold? You own this end product? So there's a cost share. The majority of the, the, the revenue to operate this facility it, uh, goes to Continuous and Energy to be able to cover the cost of operation. There is a minimum royalty, for example, the renewable natural gas, we would receive a royalty of $1 per, I think it's a million, B, million BTU for the natural gas. We would receive a royalty on the roof cover board um, as, as well as the recycling, recycling commodities. So there is cost share in there so that it covers our cost and it covers the cost of the operation by the private sector. I'm very interested in seeing the financial component of you're looking for 70 million of bonding, right? I would, you know, in our bonding experience, let's just take the big entity across the street. There are examples when we have to cover those bonds as we wait for them to pay us back because certain um, criteria hit, as in the example of the DeVos place, we end up with lower heads and beds than example we don't have the tax coming in we expected i'd really like to see what the plan is to pay the bonds and what can potentially happen that could cause the county to have to pay um, and i i want every example of where that can occur because i'm going to think coming to us you might have some challenges where you're not going to be able to pay if a, B, C, and D, or just A, or just B, or just C happen, right? We'll put the, the we have the financial analysis and we'll provide it to you. But yeah. including in that is the examples of where there could be circumstances or changes that could, re, could, could make us pay that bonding amount that's due, yeah. right? So I, I'd like to see those scenarios if there are any, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe you guys are all set and you absolutely have every bond payment that could possibly come. Um, and that's great. Answer it that way. But if there are circumstances where you might not be able to do it, I'd like to see those in writing sure. um, on this list. Um, you looked at $76 per ton for this. Is there an option for the waste haulers to not participate in this and go to landfill if they so choose. Yeah, and that's where we were speaking to the feedstock agreement that if the facility is going to be successful and the public private partnership as proposed, we would have to ensure that that waste went to that facility, either through waste to energy, th directly to the facility, or delivered to our North Kent transfer station where it would be transferred down. Okay, refresh my memory. What are they paying now? They're paying, waste to energy is currently at 55, but there are, we're proposing an increase for 2022. Uh, the recycling center is at 65, um, but it is uh, operating at a loss. And uh, landfill is in the $42 range. So you're going to go from 42 to 76. So the waste to energy facility is proposed, with, is proposed in 2022 to be 80. The recycling center, if it was operating at break even, would have to be at 120, and landfill would continue to operate at about that $42 range. 
so it would be an increase over landfill tipping fees. So how many meetings have you had with the waste haulers? We've had several meetings earlier on. We've met and continue to meet uh, with one or two of them, but over the next few weeks, we're going to be engaging them more in, few, in the months, actually, because we have to continue to have this conversation. We met with them extensively just before the pandemic hit, uh, where we were meeting with all of them to talk about recycling and how to improve waste diversion. So we'll be coming back to the waste haulers to have more of those conversations here very soon. How many waste haulers are you working with, Dar? We met with, I think we had five or six um, and then more recently, there's been two in the conversation. How many overall do you partner with in for waste hauling? Is there five? Is there 12? Is there 50? How many waste haulers total? In some consolidation. Um, Approximately. And, yeah, I, I want to say there's roughly, I'm going to be low on this guess, I think. There's probably 10 significant waste haulers that are operating in the residential commercial uh, but there's also ones that do, that haul construction, demolition, debris. You've got Republic Waste Management, um, Arrow Waste. Um, where can I find it? I want to say Tennessee, but that's not right. Um, Arrington, sorry about that. A and a few others. There's been quite a bit of consolidation in the last few years, like Evercap was purchased, Bob's Disposals was purchased. So you've seen probably three or four companies uh, purchased by other companies in the last couple of years. So from a communication standpoint, is it reasonable to ex to suggest a letter to each wa waste hauler and then um, with that letter have a meeting that is set um, with this type of information on it? For sure, I, at a minimum a letter, but, but meetings would, would be absolutely critical to explain what the new system could look like and how the system would operate. So we'll, we will be having uh, broad meetings with the haulers. Each time we've had a, a rate increase that was significant in terms of like the recycling facility to explain the changes in the market, we actually did have uh, kind of a town hall meeting where all the waste haulers were invited in to sit down to have that conversation. And we laid out very clearly and we were very transparent with our budget on the impacts of commodity revenues and everything else that had affected uh, the recycling facility so that when they were seeing the increases, they understood we weren't trying to pad the budget or create a profit. We were just trying to cover the cost of operation. And what has been explained to me is uh, by the, the, the major waste haulers that tend to go, th there's a number of waste haulers that attend the Board of Public Works meetings. There's probably two to four of them any given month that do attend. Uh, when they've had kind of sidebar conversations with me, they acknowledge that the cost of operations had gone up over the last few years. They saw that the revenues had dropped off on some of the commodities and recognized and were supportive of those rate increases because they were sensing and seeing that not only in this region but across the country. But it tends to be the more national companies that, that or the large independent haulers that attend our meetings. It's difficult uh, to get the smaller haulers to attend the meetings. So even so, what is the target time frame for all of that to happen? Are you going to have it done by November of this year? I don't know that we've put a time frame to it. We want to make sure that we're incrementally taking these, st these steps and that we're not moving too quickly. Um, but I could see that in October and in November that we would schedule and have those meetings. We wanted to make sure that we, we were able to pr provide information to this governing body and to the Board of Public Works and others. Uh, to get a better sense of the reaction to, if you will, the, the, the appreciation or, or questions that you would have before we started having these larger conversations. Also with timing, when do you plan to come to the Board of Commissioners to ask for the $70 million in bonding? That would be next year. The legacy landfill was mentioned as part of the 76 per ton. As you know, we have an ordinance. I thought that ordinance was supposed to cover that it does and that was a, a bit of a misspeak so okay. I, I apologize for that there is a dollar 68 uh, per per ton charge I, I would say that that could be folded into the overall rate and and so we could eliminate that ordinance or eliminate that surcharge and build it into a, a, a county-wide fee structure on a per ton basis if we chose to but it's not currently it's not correct the other question I have is from this feedstock agreement. 
if there are competitors that can pick up trash and then take it to a landfill outside the county, is, is that going to be a challenge for our local haulers? What we anticipate and what we would recommend is that all trash in Kent County move to one of those facilities within Kent County and that it not go to a county, to a landfill outside of Kent. We would rather capture the value and, and capture the private public investment and the, the, out, the outputs, if you will, at the business park at this mixed waste processing facility than see it go to landfill. So it would, would it be illegal for a hauler to pick up my trash and take it to a different county's landfill? What we would anticipate is the material would first come to Kent County facilities and then decisions made as to whether any needs to, any needs to be exported out. So it wouldn't necessarily be illegal, but it would have to come to one of our facilities first before it went out of county. So, but uh, I guess I'm trying to, and, and just part of my ignorance on this, how do you stop a hauler from doing what I just described? Sure, so our waste energy facility has been operating for 31 years and it serves the needs of the Metro 6. And that material that's within those uh, six cities flows to the waste energy facility unless we exempt it. There's certain materials that we don't want, like sometimes we'll get a load of shingles or mattresses or bulky items, things that aren't appropriate. Uh, and we exempt those out and haulers are allowed to take that elsewhere. We do have what's called the waste regulation specialist, kind of boots on the ground. They're double checking and making sure that the haulers are in fact um, honoring that flow district and that material is going to the waste energy facility. I would say in the early years it was a bit of a challenge, but um, I've been director now for seven years and it's not been a significant issue at all in terms of making sure that that material does arrive at the waste energy facility. In fact, we receive more than can we can actually process there right now. So you're not going to have, for example, of a republic having a lower rate for a customer and taking that trash to a different county landfill that would be competing with another waste hauler that is tied into the $76 per ton. What we would recommend and what would be necessary to enter into an agreement with CM plus A is that all that material would go to the mixed waste processing facility. So whether you're a large hauler or a small one, it's a level playing field. So you're delivering to the same location at the same rate. Yep, that's where I was headed to make sure that all of that was going to be in this mix. Um, that's what I have for now. All right, thank you, Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Bolter. Thank you. Thank you guys for your presentation today. I think this is awesome. I mean, it's, it's truly what a lot of us have talked about in terms of leading, and, and it's, it's really exciting that we could lead, Kent County could lead on something, um, which is just incredible. So. Having said that, I love the idea, love the concept, love all your work, but the devil's in the details. And I do really appreciate you slowing down and taking time to kind of come before us and get all these things ironed out. Um, so I have a few questions. <laughs> uh, one on the bonding, is there a mechanism that, that is paid back by the DPW or is that just ex payers are gonna have to pay that back? These would be considered revenue bonds, and the revenues generated okay. from this operation yep. would pay the pay the bonds. What we're proposing would be a 25-year bond. Okay. Um, with the issue of the flow control, is there a way that we could possibly look at the sequencing of this and consider diverting all of the recycling center and all of the incinerator waste there first and see how that goes before we require flow control and require all these things. Because my concern is, and I don't know the 400,000 uh, tons per year, I don't, I, I don't know what that means because I don't know how much we normally do, but could we do that so we could try it out and see where we go and then push that or, or is it just, we just have too much trash? Of things there. The, so we, uh, the short answer is that the recycling facility and the waste energy facility would not generate enough material okay. to okay. sustain the operation. Uh, we generate, I think we receive about 270,000 tons at the waste energy facility presently. 
okay. uh, we're able to process about 185 to 190,000 tons. So we do have extra there. Okay. Um, and then the recycling center is 30,000 tons. So the plant is designed to receive, it's been sized for 400,000 yeah. tons. Okay. So you get your economy scale. It could actually be built larger, so you could do it in modules and add processing okay. capacity, but we proposed something that we thought was um, happy medium, if you will, in terms of uh, recognizing the infrastructure we have and then being able to plug this in so that waste energy would continue to operate the recycling center would continue to operate for a time while we brought up the, the mixed waste processing. Could, um, how, mu how many tons then go into the landfill currently? I don't have off the top of my head what's received at South Kent Landfill, but trash is going to South Kent Landfill as well as a couple of landfills outside of Kent County. In total, we generate about a million tons per year. I think we modeled around six, roughly 650,000 tons uh, based on the material that's within our system, what we manage presently today. So, so we normally get 600,000, so we would still need those other two facilities because we're taking on more than capacity, right? Correct. Okay, Correct. that makes more sense. Um, in terms of the 90 by 30, does this get us there? or Or... How much is still going to go into a landfill? And since this property is our plan B <laughs> for landfill space, where, how long are we going to be able to extend current landfill? And what would our plan B be for the other 10 to 20% that we still have to put into a landfill? Sure. So one of the, the interesting things with this proposal versus the other one that we reviewed and recommended CM plus A is the minimum uh, when this plan is commissioned and starts, it will divert 60%. So okay. there will be 40% that needs to be uh, landfilled uh, for a time. Okay. Um, as I think uh, Tim Rouse was mentioning, there's other companies that are expressing interest in being secondary tenants. And our goal is then to bring other companies in that could manage and get us to that 90% goal. The 90% is, is realistic, but it will take time to get there. Well, because we we thought we only had about three years left on the current landfill, right? Or no? Well, I would say ten, 10 minus. Years. We have about nine years left. Okay. Yeah. So would this? How much would this extend that then? If we could get this going and, and timeline wise, how would that extend that? Another fifteen. You know, how much more would we get out of that landfill? Without doing the exact math, uh, I'm not the engineer in the right, room. Right. No. Um, this is all approximate. By, by the time. The, <laughs> If this facility would move forward, right? Let's just, with that assumption yep. in front of us, it would be a, probably about three to four years before that facility was built yep. and, and, uh, and, and operating. So yep. that means that would, we would only have about five years left right. in capacity at the South Kent Landfill. At that time, and we currently do this today, we do make decisions to send certain amounts of, of trash to other landfills and other counties to help balance kind of our airspace at South Kent Landfill, as we see as a resource, but also utilize some of the private sector landfill uh, assets that are there. The reality is I, I see a time when the South Kent Landfill will no longer exist as an operation, and okay. we believe that will occur by 2030, maybe 2032. Right. Okay. At that time. Even with this being built. Even yeah. with that being okay. built. At that time then, or, or actually moving up at that time, but actually moving toward that time, we would work with the other operators that do accept some Kent County waste today to continue to receive that material. Okay. Two one more, the, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just, just a quick sidebar is that one of the legacy concerns that we have about landfill operations, and as the director, it's something that I've been looking at for years, is that we're required by the state at a minimum for 30 years. So let's say the South Kent landfill closes in 2030. Right. We have to manage that yeah. site actively yeah. until at least 2060. Yeah. Right. So we're trying to not extend that legacy. We're right. trying to kind of draw a line and say, okay. That no makes more. sense. Um, could we, though, with the expansion opportunities, so I know this is maybe at a time when my I'll have grandkids by then, but um, eventually with expansion opportunities, could we possibly double or triple capacity where we could efficiently close all of it and it could all just feed into this operation? Is that possible? 
I, I mean, think years down the road, obviously. I, I think it's very possible, but the one thing we would want to look at is logistics because our county is growing because mm -hmm. you have right. Northern Kent County, you have the Metro 6, which is the core, then you have the Southern Kent County. Transportation logistics cost yeah. is part of that. Uh, I, I use kind of a, a round number with our Board of Public Works that when you're moving a trash truck down the road, it costs about $1.70 a minute to move it. And we think about that in terms of the haulers themselves, but we also consider that when we're moving our own and transferring our own material because it adds a cost, right. which is why we're trying to use this balanced approach. Ultimately, we think we think that there's enough interest, and in, in we know there's conversations going on with large uh, corporations that are based in West Michigan that see the, the value of what we're proposing in terms of sustainability and how it fits their corporate goals, that they, even if they exist outside of Kent County, have an interest in moving materials to this facility. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm only, my only concern is just, is this, is, is, you know, can individual municipalities choose to join? Can we make it, um, you know, can, it, it, can we make it voluntary and want to participate versus you have to participate or is it just so so my thought was if you make it voluntary I know some townships and cities are going to want to absolutely do it some are not can we be flexible enough with the other two incinerator and um, recycling center that we could ramp up but I mean just imposing a three dollar you know per month fee for someone who doesn't want to do it is sometimes a challenge so I know it's it doesn't sound like a lot but is there flexibility in this plan at all to to create incentives and voluntary participation? Well, I think the overarching answer is that the reason why we rely on landfills today was public policy that was put in place at the state level nearly 40 years ago. That public policy has driven the development of landfills, which at that time was seen as the best option, best solution. One of the things that we've heard consistently uh, within the Metro 6 is that they participate in waste energy and, and there is a cost difference between waste energy and land. And as in, and in my mind, as I've listened to that conversation, their frustration, as I understand it, is that as the townships, if you will, have grown up around them, are now sophisticated, have significant yep. business infrastructure there, that they're at a disadvantage. So, so what I've heard is be consistent and have a countywide solution. Don't have kind of this fragmented solution. And then as we think about participation and the amount of material that we need for economy of scale, the short answer I believe is that it would have to be a countywide solution. And okay. if, you, if you have some, other than perhaps if you've got some very, I'm just thinking of, of the county map and the population of some of the townships, you may have some northern tier uh, very rural townships mm -hmm. that maybe if they're under 10,000 in population or some other mechanism that that it wouldn't necessarily make sense and, and the waste wouldn't absolutely be necessary to make the project work. Okay. But I think that the tough answer or at least the thing that, that we're going to have to struggle with and, and the policy board here mm -hmm. is going to have to struggle with is that countywide solution yep, uh, sure. that's been requested in some level. I, I just would ask that any and all material you have, if you can keep getting, you know, I would love to see the survey and keep us feeding us this information so we can stay ahead of it. Would be really appreciative and thanks again for all your work. All right, um, Commissioner Steck, did you have a question? I did, thank you, Chair. To remember what to do with my bike. So, uh, good morning, Dar. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to drill down a little bit on this. So my understanding in general is this, uh, this facility is about a $350 million project and the DPW will be the core owner of the facility? We will own the, the, the building envelope okay. and the mixed waste processing portion. The other companies, the CM plus A would own uh, the envelope where the manufacturing plan is and that equipment. So there would be a a, a split there, a line drawn, if you will. Right, so <clears throat> this is not something you just put on a truck and take away. So um, I assume that it's constructed there on our facility, on our within our envelope, as you say. That's correct. And then we have essentially a, a, a lease agreement with them, with a um, with a feedstock agreement, part of that lease or independent as part of that. 
So that's really the core component of it, isn't it? You need to have the capacity to provide that material to them on an ongoing basis. For sure, and, and it's a great observation. One of the things that, as director, when we started looking at this, you know, six, seven years ago, and, and I'm 25 years into this business, is we recognized, and, and I think the survey proved it out, that if, if we're going to do what we're doing right now, and it's just put it in a landfill, I don't think anyone has interest in making changes to how we do business at, at DPW. But the feedstock agreements are critical to providing the material that continuous and energy and need. Energy it cannot create uh, renewable natural gas and fertilizer if they don't have the food waste. Continuous materials cannot generate uh, and, and produce that cover board if they don't have the fiber and the plastic film. And then the other ancillary items, the commodities and other things that are, are part of this package for revenue, that supports the overall operation of the facility. What, what we've seen, and, and we've got, the, you know, we've got the, the studies and we've shared this with the Board of Public Works, we've been in the recycling business now, processing recycling for 30 years. We're in our second uh, generation of facilities and we're in our second generation of equipment at that facility. But even with everything that we've done in, in Kent County, I, I love Kent County, and its residents and what we do here, we're still only <coughs> recycling about 25% of just the residential stream. So 75% of it is still going to landfill. And so all that material that you would want to go through a recovery facility, we don't receive because it's not placed in the right cart, but the material that we need, uh, the feedstock agreement to ensure that it gets to the right facility so it can be placed into these commodities or manufacture a board or the generation of would be needed. So uh, I guess what I'm wondering a little bit is is what's the resiliency of this system once it's set up because it strikes me that overall uh, you have to have stock has to come in. You got to have the, the material coming in and whatever that level is it has to be there and if it's not there then I assume the economics don't fit anymore. Likewise you have to have a market on the back side of this for the products that you're talking about here and the and the uh, fertilizer or compost, whatever that's generated. So all those are subject to changes that are outside our control. Um, is the agreement with the, the proposed operator then on a 10-year a basis, a fixed-year basis, ongoing basis, and, and what's the flexibility that either we have or they have to opt out if the economics change? So we, we haven't negotiated the agreement yet, but it was anticipated to be a 25-year agreement. I could provide, I think, local perspective, but I'd like Steve Simmons to provide regional and, and national perspective on the feedstocks and the volatility or the, the ups okay. and downs. Okay, but before he does that, I guess sure. we, what I'm also looking for is do, do we have a plan B because the fact is we've all seen economics change, sometimes radically, sometimes not. Um, so if the system were to no longer be financially feasible, um, I have to presume that the operator will either walk out or go into bankruptcy or something happens and, and there we have a facility without an operator. What's, what happens in that event? Yeah, so Steve will speak to some specifics, but a couple thoughts is the way we've set this up is that regardless of what happens to the Everboard production, let's say, and, and Steve, we did a lot of uh, due diligence. We interviewed uh, uh, major manufacturers and major companies that distribute uh, roof cover board to understand what the market looked like and, and and how this product was performing within that market. Many of you probably don't realize that in our waste energy facility, the operator that was operating that facility bankrupted. And we never missed a day because of the way the, the agreement was set up, the fact that Kent County was operating the tipping floor. We went through bankruptcy with a company that bankrupted, I don't know, 20 years into the continue to operate every day. So the idea with, with this is even if a portion of this plant went offline, because you can still generate recycling commodities, you can generate renewable natural gas, let's say the cover board goes offline, uh, there's a lot of things that would happen before that would ever occur, but that allows us to kind of unplug and plug another technology in. So there is flexibility built into it. But I want, I'd like to have Steve provide some national perspective on that. Um, risk, <laughs> you know, uh, in my crystal ball, I got, I got it out here, but it's a little fuzzy 25 years out, right? But, but very great, good question. I mean, what if? Because it, it, things do change. Uh, let me try to break it into 
two or three components. Uh, one, risk of the markets, uh, this, this cover board. You know, uh, this, the plant size is 150 million square feet a year. The current market for this material is about 2 billion square feet a year. And, and this is not just a new construction product, it's a remodeling product, right? Roofs have to be replaced every couple of years, or every 15 years or so. And, and one of the things in talking to the, the roofing contractors and people, why, why do you like this product? This product has from Factory Mutual a, a what's called a very severe hail rating. That's a new, since 2019, um, rating system by Factory Mutual. And this product is suitable in, in a very severe hail rating. It needs to be able to take a two inch ice ball falling from the sky at 100 miles an hour and it just bounces and doesn't break the roof. Uh, there's not many products out there today that can do that. This one can and it's priced competitively with the alternatives out there. That's why they like it and that's why they say, they say we can't get enough of this product. So there's a, there's a market demand out there. We also, in talking with Continuous, observed and saw at their factory, this is their entry product, but they have a whole product development cycle and are doing testing to get into other products, fencing, decking board, even the furniture manufacturing industry. They've had extensive discussions with the manufacturers around here. How can you use this product in your, in your product? So that's, that's one way to cover, to, to cover it off on the product side. Natural gas, I think there'll always be a natural gas market for, for the next 25 years at least of some sort. It's gonna be a matter of price, but there the vendor's taking all the price risk. The county's getting a royalty, and edges, as they're getting a royalty on the, um, the, the board. So that you don't have any price volatility risk. Um, so that, that's one level of risk. Another is, Tadar said, the, you know, the waste energy operator, I remember this because I was in that business at that time, you know, went bankrupt 20 years ago and kept going. We've looked at that, and one of the reasons for structuring it the way we have is so that, you know, God forbid that happened. The county actually owns enough of the infrastructure that there's a place for the trucks to come in, put their waste down, and it can be picked back up and sent to an out-of-county landfill. That's not, a, that's not a nice solution, but you know, sitting where you're sitting, you wanna make sure there's a place for it to go. May not be at the same price, but trash can get picked up and trash can move and go someplace. Well, that's, that's, that's excellent, because that's what I was looking for, is um, if, if the economics change, if the market changes, it all looks good now, but things do happen, um, that we avoid the situation where suddenly it's not getting processed and it's just piling up, right? So it's got to go somewhere in that event, and that's the plan B. The, is it going then, uh, if that all happens, is it going to surrounding landfills and surrounding counties, and does that take agreements with these? Uh, is that? So, you know, in, in the overall structure, the, the DPW for the residue and others will have ongoing contractual relationships with an out-of-county landfill. You've just got to negotiate that enough so that you've got rights maybe to send more. You know, I, right. yeah, we would all be scrambling if that happened. But I, you know, I, I feel we've looked at and thought about it. There would be a place for the trash to go, you know, and, and sitting in your seats, that's what one of the things that, that would keep me up at night. Where's this going to go? Because it doesn't sit well at the curb for very long. Well, it doesn't keep me up at night yet, but I don't <laughs> want it to either. But, um, it's good. Thank you for that. So, um, I had another question, just a uh, operational. The the proposed operator is uh, you call it CNNA. I guess that's Continuous Materials and Plus Energy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, is that a new uh, formed joint well, entity? Yeah. There's there, there are two independent corporations. They would go together and form a special purpose, a, a local project company that they would invest in and run. They might get other outside investors. Much like even at your waste and energy plant today, there's a, a corporate entity called Covanta Kent Inc. That's the your contract party is that special purpose. So it'll it'll follow that model. They'll hire employees, uh, or maybe one of the partners will come in and be the managing partner. I don't think they've thought right. all of that through. What we did see, and we toured, 
they're both operating a facility today it's not like they haven't ever operated anything they'll just need to decide amongst partners in a joint venture who's going to do what any history of them operating together or are these kinds of entities joining together I mean I just uh, there's a reason why they're functioning as different <laughs> companies right because they have different philosophies and different uh, uh, perspectives and a different culture and so anytime you put two of those together um, you at least have questions to ask you certainly do um, I, I don't know of any case where these two companies have done a joint venture before they came together because they've got two different widgets that together make a really cool solution so that's why they're joining together um, was that their idea or our idea? It was, it was their idea. Okay. We, we put out a, an RFP to the world, you know, and, and got back nine proposals. Good. So and my other question, just following up on uh, some of the others that are already asked to see some pro formas on, you know, what's the sensitivity going forward to the income and the outgo, uh, outflow uh, of expenses and income. And uh, it sounds like it's all set uh, well below market and this should be sound, but our due diligence probably is to take a hard look at that. All Thank right, you. Commissioner Legrand. Thank you. Um, I, I have two questions. One, I wanted to follow up on what both Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Bolter were asking about how, how we get to the countywide, um, you know, stock so that we can uh, satisfy the feedstock agreement. So that would be a county regulation you know, th that's something that you need the commissioners to set. Obviously, that wouldn't be a state law. You need some kind of legal requirement. So what, what would, would you be looking is, for? What we would do is recommend uh, a couple of paths. Most likely, or, or at least one option, would use the existing solid waste management ordinance that we have in Kent County uh, and rework that a little bit. We've had some conversation with outside counsel on different mechanisms, but we haven't settled on a single one. But we would bring a recommendation back to the Board of Public Works for here's the one or two or three best options that we've developed. Uh, which one do you think is the best one to move forward to the Board of Commissioners for consideration? But it would have to be a countywide. Um, my. My uh, second question just does have to do with the Everboard, and you addressed it a little bit in that last answer um, about possible diversification in case, you know, what do you see as possibilities in case um, would these companies make something besides this single board product? Um, or do you think more you would be looking for, they would be looking for <laughs> other applications for this product? And just in terms of making us comfortable with, you know, this, uh, investment and feeling like they're going to keep, they're going to stay in business. Yeah, so Steve mentioned, uh, and while we were there, they, they have a, a research and development lab and talk um, about working with some of the office furniture manufacturers here in actually West Michigan where they could use this board uh, as a shelf or in another application. They also uh, were doing testing on fencing, uh, I believe decking, uh, Siding, so they, they, they see the cover board as an entry to the market and they have the, uh, the, the various approvals, ASTM and others, uh, so that it's actually a, a, a product that's being sold into the market today and is approved. They have to go through that same process for some of these other materials and I think they're trying to develop what would be, what they would consider their next best entry into the market. So we know they're looking at it, they're talking about it. Uh, they haven't shared with us yet which that might be, but I know that they've had conversations with and have been providing some samples to some of the local manufacturers. That's fantastic to hear. Um, <coughs> and then can you, how many current plants are there in the United States that make this product? So I, I think there's just one. There's just the one that we spoke of in Iowa. Just the one. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Bukowski. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, following up on a few other things that folks asked, thanks, Dart, um, and uh, uh, 
quick, real quick, on this chart where it says the impact to curbside costs for processing, is there anticipated um, next line that would say impact to curbside cost for transportation in the sense like how much we have to move the garbage from where to where and because we don't, well, we only move it from facility to facility. We don't move it from curbside to our facility. So what what is there a potential impact on customers? For transportation, I don't anticipate any because the, the, the haulers that are out there today would continue to operate as they do. Um, we'll be proposing to the Board of Public Works uh, the potential uh, to have a new uh, facility at the North Kent Transfer Station. Uh, we were looking at that even before this where haulers on that northern side could actually tip the recyclables there and then we could transfer it down. Uh, that being said is the haulers today are delivering to the North Kent Transfer Station. They're delivering to landfills outside of Kent County. They're delivering to South Kent, waste to energy, the recycling facility itself that was redundant. Um, so they're already in, impacted by and having a, to cover that transportation cost and that would continue. Okay, so not anticipated additional costs from curbside to any of our facilities. Correct. I, I think where there's a potential savings, uh, and this is way down the road, um, because we have to have, a, a, I think, a robust conversation around it, is we currently have source-separated recyclables, which means second cart. If mixed waste processing, or when, let me put it this way, when mixed waste processing proves itself out, we could have a conversation about do you want to go to a single cart system. That may, that may, I think we have education and we have a lot of years around more than one <laughs> cart. And I think, we, you know, when you think about habits and practices and, and all the education, everything that we've provided, it will be time, it'll take time to determine whether or not that's the right thing to do. But, the, but when you eliminate a cart, you eliminate a route. And when you eliminate a route, you eliminate that cost. So that's something to consider. The other side of that, though, is that you still have that material to pick up, and so it's not necessarily a one-to-one a, a -one reduction because you still have that material to put in a truck, and it may take more trucks to move it. All right. And then just from a high-level um, decision-making milestones, um, so that in a month um, we as those of us here who are on the Board of Public Works are going to be asked to approve this phase in the sense of we're choosing to enter into serious negotiations with CMNA. And, but then you mentioned like bonding is a year out, um, guaranteed delivery, that could be like implemented three or four years out. So I mean, and where, yeah, so we decide on October 7, let's go. I mean, where's, where's off ramps for us? Or back almost following up with, you know, Commissioner Bolter's comments that two years from now, we're like, oh, this just ain't it. And, and now we have to buy, or do we develop landfills on this? I mean, we're, yeah, where's all these various off ramps over the next five years? Yeah, so we built in or off ramps further decisions. intentionally because we know that the Board of Public Works will have to weigh in on certain things and the Board of Commissioners will have to weigh in on certain things. So the next step in the process would be to enter in what's called a project development agreement. Uh, to put it in my terms, it's, it's the engagement, not the wedding. And what that means is that do you get the ring back afterwards kind of thing if something doesn't work out. But in, 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 in reality, what that does set up is it sets up the terms and conditions for the county to move forward and, and CM plus A to move forward, you're looking at development of the business park itself, right? The infrastructure, you're looking at, at the, uh, and getting the full engineering design put together by the company and selecting a, you know, a, an architect, an engineer and incurring those costs. A project development agreement then lays out what happens if things don't work out. And here's the list of things of why it doesn't work out. And here's what it means if we choose to terminate for cause terminate out of convenience, and there's a financial impact to both the county and to CM plus A, and, and there would be uh, a payment made based on, on dollars spent within that agreement. Usually it's 1% of the total project cost, so you're looking at roughly a $3 million 
risk. That is something that could be managed within the DPW budget. Uh, it's not that it's insignificant, uh, but I think within that then you have to go into that agreement with an understanding of the feedstock agreement and ensuring that all the waste would move to these facilities and the bonding and whether or not you know the county is in a position and wants to support that. So that's where the Board of Commissioners comes back in. So, so it, you have to make sure that you've got things in the right order, but there are off ramps there. We would want to have a, a good sense of what um, governing bodies were thinking about in terms of, of, of bonding and uh, feedstock agreements before we would enter into a PDA. If we do enter into the PDA, there are still off ramps there that let's say we get a year or 18 months or two years down the road, the way we would set it up, it'd be like a 30 month agreement. And if we don't get, if we can't get to the finish line in 30 months, then we part ways. Uh, but at the same time, there's there's some risk there. And so there, there is potential for the county to pay out if, if in fact it can't meet its obligations. Great, Commissioner Skaggs. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just, um, just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, you know, I think uh, Commissioner Bolter really uh, makes a strong point here that this uh, project would make us, uh, and, and, and Commissioner Brevey and I saw this out in California, would make us a, a leader nationwide, um, or at least everything east of California. Um, and although I missed Tim's presentation, which I, you know, I'm sorry, um, but I probably heard it before, although I like to hear you talk. Um, the, uh, that, that this gear really gives us a high reward here in that we could really become a hub for this kind of technology and these kinds of businesses like we saw on Medical Hill. Um, but, you know, so, so we're not the first, just to make an analogy, you know, we're not the first or second or, or tenth city to, to build a convention center. Um, we're not the thousandth city to build a convention center here. Um, but we are building something new, and that does come with some risk. Um, I know from conversations we've had that we're not alone on this, right? We're not jumping out on a limb. Um, we might be the first to be sort of tentatively looking at the limb and walking out on the limb, um, <laughs> but it would be a little... It would make me more nervous if others weren't uh, looking to us uh, and thinking about following our lead. Um, so what what are some of the communities, I think maybe this is a question for Steve really, what are some of the communities that are looking to see if this technology that's been proven elsewhere, say Europe, California, um, can work outside of those geographic areas? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, as I said earlier, we, we do a national practice. So we, I have clients from California to Maine, and uh, there, are, there are lots of, of my clients who are looking at this project. We, we have been talking about this project within the industry at trade shows and industry associations for a couple of years now. And uh, there's a lot of excitement about it. You know, I, I talked about a 70, $76 system fee anything from New York up through Maine, that's a below market price. So they're, they're looking at, at these things quite closely because their alternative is to put waste in a rail car and ship it to Ohio. But they've got their own constraints, uh, you know, coming up with even 30 or 40 acres might be more difficult there. But there is a high level. I've, I've had a lot of clients asking about it. I've been kind of putting them off saying, I can't, I can't get in front of my, uh, my client, Dar, until he's talked to his board about it, but I could, I could share with you my calls with other clients start tomorrow. You know, they, they, there's a lot of interest in this, and this, whole, this really ties into this theme of a circular economy, you know, where the output of one becomes feedstock for another, so the output of the trash becomes the feedstock for the, for the building uh, products. And so there's a, there's a tremendous amount of interest pushing it this way. Great. Um, do I have any other questions from the commissioners at all? Any questions or comments? Yeah, Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. Just one follow-up question. The uh, the three dollars and ten cent um, proposed impact that would be the impact that my neighbors would potentially pay as we go forward with this. Did I understand that would include uh, a uh, a combined 
a system whereby they would all be uh, providing traditional trash as well as recycling and compost? I thought it was I, an easy I, I think the three, t I, I, I want to make sure I answer it accurately. Yeah. And, and we, I know we've looked at a lot of different systems. At DPW has encouraged the Board of Public Works to consider um, a combined system where when you buy your trash cart, you automatically get a recycling cart. Uh, a company that was recently bought out, Evercap, they kind of did that. They would go, oh, right. okay, trash is, I'll just pick a number, $15 a month. And, oh, we'll give you the recycling cart. Yeah, but I don't want it. But I think you'll like it and you'll use it. And before you knew it, they had another recycling customer. I, I, with the 310, it would be an adder on to their existing system, their, so their existing service, because it's really based on the trash side of the business, right? It's what you put in your trash cart is where this price increase would occur. And we had, I think, I forget which commissioner question, I think it was Commissioner Bukowski about would there be any additional impact in terms of transportation cost to the end customer? And, and the answer is no, um, but the answer could be actually you could improve the, the cost structure on transportation if someday you went to a single bin. But the reality is if you have two carts, you need two trucks, and you have two routes, even if recycling is picked up every other week, you're still running that route, and so there's a cost involved. Um, our best understanding is about 25% of Kent County residents have curbside recycling or some recycling of some sort. Um, and so if they would if they would add recycling, they would actually add that cost as they would today. Uh, hey, I only have trash, but I want to add recycling. The compost piece is interesting in that the food waste within the existing trash um, would go to anaerobic digestion and fertilizer, but most of the time yard waste is still collected outside that, and this system isn't designed to handle yard waste. So it, we think a more robust composting operation at the business park or at another location, similar to what the city of Grand Rapids has for their residents, is, is needed because we've done a study, we have it available, be happy to send it to you electronically, that really outlines what composting resources do we have and where are the gaps here in Kent County. But so to be clear, the, the 310 is a projected cost on the trash side of this That's only. Correct. And this system, if we move forward, if you move forward with this, doesn't necessarily address the question of a combined um, recycling, composting, trash uh, contracting. That has to be dealt with separately or would you deal with that in your new ordinance? Could Maybe for a later within, conversation. Your, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking through that. That's interesting. Um, it could be handled a few different ways. You could still have that choice at the curb. You could have that choice uh, decided by the municipality, for example, I think, East Grand Rapids, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you have trash, recycling is part of that combined um, package, if you will. So it's like if I get my internet and I get my, my uh, TV, if I, get, you know, if I put them together, I get one price as, as opposed to paying two different bills. But you don't need to deal with that issue to get to this project? Not necessarily. Okay. We could, but we don't have to. Okay. Good questions. All right, Commissioner Bolter. Madam Chair, uh, just a couple follow-ups. So on the recycling piece, you know, it's the three-legged stool. So if we're continuing to run a deficit at the recycling center, will this further exacerbate that deficit because we're getting material coming? I mean, how how do we make up that um, that issue? It seems like it would be continuing. So we asked uh, both uh, proposers, the two finalists and the CM plus A, which is what we recommended, what would it cost to add recycling processing at, at the mixed waste processing facility? And this the $76 per ton actually includes that processing at the, at the mixed waste processing facility. So as envisioned today, we don't have to, but we could see a day uh, four or five years ago where we would turn off our current facility yep. on Wealthy, okay. and we would shift that material That's what I was down yep. to be processed okay. because you get economy of scale. Right. Okay. Our recycling center is actually operating efficiently. It's, the rate is just below market rate right now. Okay. So, um, but I think the economy of scale, being able to process 430,000 tons or 400,000, adding that 30,000 is an incremental increase. Yeah, I mean, I just want I just want to be sure we were open to that, you know, 
it just doesn't make sense to keep running it if it's going to be a massive deficit and and I just wanted to be sure we were considering that. Um, the second thing I just want to, you know, I just have to mention this um, because we, we, we've uh, messed around with fees quite a bit for garbage. I think it's really, really important that the 310, if that's the, if that's the number, that's what it has to be. And people, you know, I want to be sure that we're including their costs. I mean, if I'm way up in Nelson Township and I've got to haul it all the way down, is their cost going to be higher than 310? Because that hauler has additional transportation costs and all these things. So I just want to make sure that 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 while you're in, in creating this plan, that you are really thinking all, through all of that. Because the worst thing we can do is set this, tell people this is how much it is, and then need in two years to come raise it. Or, or I thought this was only going to be three dollars, and and their company raises it ten dollars because they have all these additional costs. So I think that's really, really important as we proceed through this. That that we're very, very transparent to people, to the community, um, moving forward. So I just want to make that comment. Thank you. One of the reasons why we brought Plant Moran on board, and, and actually Jeff Dode, our fiscal services director, recommended Plant Moran and the team that's with us, is to ensure that we had looked at that. I don't. I think we'd be remiss to say that we haven't turned over every stone, but I. Th but we've really worked hard to look at the transportation and the processing and the disposal. We've considered it, maybe there's a time when the recycling education center doesn't have to operate anymore, and. We, we're, you know, and how about transfer costs and where do you pick up transfer costs and where do you no longer have transfer costs? For example, what we would, uh, what we anticipate is the waste, we receive too much trash at the waste energy facility to process and by which we have to transfer out. There's a cost to do that. This proposal anticipates that that material would go directly to the uh, mixed waste processing facility. So we actually increase efficiency and, that, and not having to move it twice so those are the type of things that we have thought through. So thank you. Commissioner Bukowski. Yeah, um, real quick, uh, maybe. Um, have we done any modeling of, of carbon and greenhouse gases? Like over the next 20, 30 years, does this net positive, net negative, the same? We did some modeling earlier. I believe it, it was net negative because of the methane that's generated at the landfill. While we do capture most of it, we don't capture it all. Waste energy has a, has a negative carbon uh, impact because of uh, the, the methane that's not generated at the landfill, as with the mixed waste. I'd have to go back to look at it. I know we looked at it, we reviewed it and considered it as part of the process, but we didn't use just that as a decision factor in what we presented today. All right, any further questions from the commissioners? All right, seeing none, um, I appreciate all the thought that went into your questions, all the answers. Um, if there's further questions down the road, let me know, let Dar know, and we'd be happy to get you the information. I know there's a few pieces of information, um, and I'll touch base with you on that too, Dar, that some of the commissioners asked for. Our next item on the agenda is um, public comment. Um, do we have any members from the public who would like to comment on this at all? Please join us at the podium. All right. Please state your name and your address. Thank you. Uh, I'm Russ Borsma with Arrow Waste. Uh, we are located at 1296 Chicago Drive in Jenison. And I guess I just wanted to voice, point out a couple things for the commissioners in considering this. Um, uh, when we talk about you know feed stock or guaranteed delivery it definitely equals flow control uh, which is every home every business within the county needing to be um, their waste taken into this system so it is affecting every resident every business um, because all of that waste would then have to go within the system uh, the tipping fee starting at 76 sounds like uh, they've done a lot of research on that and I could see that as a starting point um, similar to the recycle center when it started at zero or ten dollars and now we're at ninety dollars you know it's a very commodity based tipping fee based on what's going on 
uh, with the system and also with the economy, basically. Uh, so seeing that it could start at this and go up from there, again, affecting every resident and business within the county. Um, you know, 310, um, that is also an estimation based on, you know, um, their numbers, but it does ultimately come back to the waste haulers and what we are paying and what um, our costs are. So saying 310 now, um, you know, it, it could go up from there, and it's based on every waste hauler um, getting their numbers in line and getting their costs in line um, because we would have to take all the trash into the system. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate your comments on telling everybody 310, but that's also, you know, kind of our business as well, too, where we have to um, figure out what our costs are, and our costs may not equal the same um, estimate that the, that the county has come up with. Um, so it's hard to tell everybody that it's only going to be 310 when we get all of our costs and all of our um, you know, things in line where it could be more than 310. And that number is out there to the public, and they're expecting 310, but then all the waste haulers are figuring maybe it's five, maybe it's six. Uh, just something to consider. Um, also, um, it is, I, I think we, I've heard talk about Plan B and landfill space. Um, that is definitely a consideration that you should also be thinking of. This is being built on uh, landfill <coughs> space, on land that can be used as a landfill at a later date. Um, I understand that, you know, landfilling is not definitely the preferred way or that, that the way that we want to go with all of our trash, but um, the landfill does support your system. So the landfill is taking in a lot of trash and supporting other things within your system, such as waste to energy or your recycle center. Um, once this property is built as a sustainable business park, then that land is no longer available for landfill, which may be a preference of the county, but it is also putting all the eggs into that basket that this is going to work out. And then going back to landfilling, that's not gonna be an option, um, but also not feeding the rest of your system as well. Um, and the only, the last thing is cautioning on taking trash and recycling together. I've heard a couple conversations about that and there has been a lot of models throughout the United States where that doesn't work. You know, we've had one locally that even the city of Holland was participating in where they took trash and recycling together and it is just so dirty and so contaminated. Um, that is an issue with recycling is that it has to be clean and that's kind of why China has shut us off is that it's not clean material once you mix it. So, you know, you can get some stuff out of it and, you know, there is quite a bit of recycling going in with the trash that may be able to be taken out and processed but just warn that everything going together in one cart is not, from my perspective, a sustainable uh, solution there because source separation and getting the clean material for the most amount of money is still the most cost effective way. So those are my comments, thank you. Thanks Russ, I appreciate those comments. Anyone else from the public that'd like to speak today? All right, seeing none, um, our next item on the agenda is miscellaneous. Is there any commissioner miscellaneous at all? Yeah. Commissioner Jones. I have a quick one. Can we talk about just very briefly in miscellaneous the $5 million that we might be able to capture if there's state law change for the recyclable cans? Stan, that was one of the, were you asking Stan or were you asking uh, John? Anybody. The 10 cent, um, Ian Third. cans, what? Huh? <laughs> it was a priority. <laughs> yeah, we have a legislative priority to to try to get some momentum to end up with a $5 million a year uh, opportunity for the, the deposits on the cans. I, and I was just wondering where that was. Jar, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So what we've noticed over the last number of years, particularly during the pandemic, but it, it was influenced by that, but it's occurring anyway, is more residents that are using recycling are tending to put their their deposit containers in the recycling bin as a co convenience instead of bringing their dimers back to the store, right? 
And we saw that increase because of the pandemic and right there were the uh, bottle uh, return uh, facilities were closed for quite some time. The last estimate that we've generated is that over 6 million deposit containers are going to the recycling facility today. And the way the state law is set up, we're unable to redeem those. So we're receiving those, we're incurring the cost of processing. Yes, we do get the value of the aluminum as a commodity, but there's a lot of money on the table, if you will, it takes 6 million times 10 cents or 7 million uh, as that continues to increase. We think it's fair. We think it's it's the right thing to do that since we're receiving those that we should be able to receive the deposit value from that and that was really what was behind the conversation we've had some conversations with legislators we've had some conversations uh, I think with the former governor's office uh, we really couldn't get any traction or maybe just a lack of understanding around that issue but there are material recovery facilities today including Kent County's that receives significant numbers of bottle deposit containers and we're unable to redeem those for the 10 cents. All right, so where, where are we on getting the momentum to get that? Is there a state rep who's taking it or a state senator or? So we've had conversations with, uh, with, the, with the legislator and with the Legislative Services Bureau around could you craft language to make that change? I think what we've run into is that the industry as a whole, so the grocery retailers and others, um, when you wade into that space, there are other changes or thinking that they would like to bring to that to the bottle bill to update it. And so there's a lot of push and pull around, just leave it the way it is, or do we take it on and try to make this change and what else happens with that? And so we've not gotten a lot of traction in, in getting interest in having something like this introduced. There's been a couple of bottle bill uh, house bills over the last couple of years that have been introduced it hasn't addressed this issue I don't know if there's a bottle bill out there right now um, being considered I don't recall I know there's been several in the last year or two thanks, know for, th thanks for letting me address it during miscellaneous but it, it is it it ties into this because it would be one more stream of funding and it could be millions of dollars less, they need to ask for bonding if all that could be applied. So that's why I thought I would ask. If I may. Go uh, ahead, Commissioner Skaggs. That sounds about right, yeah. I think the number is somewhere between 500 and 600,000 a year that we could recover. Yeah, because you would give up the, the value of the aluminum commodity, but you'd be receiving the 10 cents. And historically, the 10 cents per container is much higher. There's 32 containers in a pound of, uh, of aluminum. So we've, we've done the math. And to your point, you might receive like a tomato juice container or something else that's aluminum. But we've done enough analysis on the material that we do receive that 90% of what's going into that bale our bottle deposit containers because they're aluminum, which uh, and, and you can walk by a bale. I know anecdotally and you go, oh, there's a Miller can, oh, there's a Coca-Cola can, there's a Sprite container. I mean, it's obvious that most of that bale is our, our dime containers. It's just a question of coming up with a percentage that can be agreed to and a mechanism to allow that those dollars to flow back. Like locally, Shoepan is a company that processes, I think, maybe half for they're, they're certainly a part, they're a partner with the state in processing those bottle return containers. We sell the shoe pan today. It's a matter of whether or not we can move that to them. They could verify where it came from, the percentage, or at least agreed to upon percentage, and then pay us the deposit back. 
somehow, but there has to be a mechanism within the statute which was never anticipated uh, that way. Because I think when the law was first introduced, 98, 99% of the containers were recovered and we're down to that 89%. It's not that they're not all being recovered, but some of those are going to recycling centers now. So for us in Kent County. It's not five million, it's five million cans, yes. but it's it's 500 to 600,000 potentially. Per month. Yes. But it's not going to right. Like that. Thanks. Good question. Dang. Not an easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any further commissioner miscellaneous? It would be amazing if it did. <laughs> Seeing none. <laughs> Our meeting is adjourned and I um, welcome any further questions down the road. Thank you.